Okay, so uh, at tonight's session, we will have a revision for the final written online assessment. And, oh, and by the way, uh, how do you feel about the fact that it's now week 12? You're just about to complete another course, which brings you closer to your milestones and closer to becoming, you know, uh, full-fledged solicitors in Australia. So that's really a good thing. So it should be, it should, should, it should call a, for a celebration on your part to have gone this far. Don't you think? Okay, so hold on. Um, Ah, Matt says, happy disclosure, it'll miss you. It's okay. Exhausted, yeah, from Jenny to good, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm actually hoping that uh, no one will fail this course and that many of you will get high distinctions. And by the way, if I could make a request, I'm hoping that at the end of uh, tonight's tutorial, if you, if you haven't done so, can I ask you to really uh, fill up the survey? Because I've only seen five uh, people, uh, you know, saying something there and... Uh, my concern is, what if those were, were the kind of students who hated me for one reason or another? Uh, at least I'm hoping that because we've been together for some time, uh, you will say something nice about me <laughs> and the way that the course was run. So uh, if you could do it, it shouldn't take you more than five minutes. And it's very important that uh, we really get that kind of uh, feedback from students. Okay? So can, can I, you know, again, just as a reminder, please, uh, fill up the survey if you haven't done yet. Please do it after the, uh, the tonight's session. Okay, so for tonight's session, thank you, Ali. So for tonight's session, um, there are two parts I'd like to cover. I'll cover first the the preparation for the assessment, so that's the form part, the formal part, and the, then I'll talk about the substantive aspect. So it's crucial that we talk about um, the form part. Uh, how to prepare for the assessment, and in particular about the IRAC or the CIRAC format. Uh, it's crucial because if you're dealing with a problem-based question, it's always very, very critical and very crucial that you identify what the legal issue is or what the legal issues are. That's crucial. Even if you don't state it, it's important that you know what the legal issue is or what the legal issues are because Having being able to identify the legal issue provides you a roadmap as to how you will end up discussing uh, and providing an answer to the to the case problem. Because remember, we're dealing with problem-based questions or case-based uh, questions, and so therefore, it's like if you don't know what the problem is, then you can't have an answer. And without knowing what the without knowing what the problem is. You know, anything you say will likely be off tangent and it might even be irrelevant. And it's like, you know, when you go to a doctor, the, before the doctor can dispense some advice or write out a script or tell you what your problem is, he needs to know what exactly is the problem, what's going on. So he, he needs to know the facts and then he say, okay, the, this seems to be the problem and then this is what we can do. In the same manner, we need to follow certain, uh, you know, rules of reasoning. And the way to do that is always to begin by identifying the correct issue. If you don't know what the, the, the legal issue is, you've got a problem because in all likelihood, you will end up uh, not, be able, not being able to answer the uh, case problem correctly nor adequately. And obviously, we begin by... Um, there are at least two ways of doing it. One is called the IRAC, which is actually similar to the CIRAC. In, Cy in CIRAC, you simply begin with a conclusion at the start and then state what the legal issue is and what the rules are, how to apply the rules to the facts, and coming up with the conclusion again. So let's just go through that briefly. Uh, again, as I said, when you go through a case problem in the final written online assessment or for any uh, course in uh, in the law discipline that you might have is always very important for you to be able to identify what the legal issue is. And so sometimes you'll ask, okay, the first thing I need to know is, am I looking at the possibility of the facts? Am I looking at the possibility of um, 
applying for judicial review or am I looking for merits review? Am I looking at what, what might the grounds be for me to apply for either you know, a merits review or a judicial review? And what exactly are the legal remedies that I'm looking for? So you need to be able to state clearly, identify in your mind what the issue is. And once you've identified what the issue is, that's when you state what the rule is. Uh, the rule in the case of blah, blah, blah. And then you say that based on the facts, this is the way that uh, the rule should be applied to the facts. And as a result, this is the conclusion. So, you know, you know that part, okay? The important thing is you need to be able to identify clearly what the issue is because if you don't know what the issue is, you're likely to get it wrong. Now, it's in, in all likelihood, there will be multiple issues in the case problems. You need to be able to identify each of them if you want to end up uh, having a high distinction answer. Clear so far? Now, so having, because you're familiar with the IRAC and the CIRAC format by now, what is important is that it's like if you were to be a lawyer and uh, a client came to you for legal advice, the double conclusion seems, no, 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 no. no it seems like a waste of the word count. Not exactly. What it simply means is I would advise that he, do th that he does this. It's as simple as that. So in other words, at the very start, we know where your discussion is headed. Now remember, your answers are an, are an attempt to try to persuade the examiner or me, the marker, that you're getting it right. So you need to be able to provide a roadmap as to you know, how your discussion will proceed. And the best way to do that is to say that uh, this is what my advice will be, and you know, this, this is the issue, and so therefore I would know as a marker where your discussion is headed. Otherwise, if you, know, you start talking about the issue and then you start the discussion, it, it's difficult to make sense as to where you're headed with your discussion. And it shouldn't take, what, more than six words or even 10 words at the most for that initial statement just to flag to the reader or the, or the marker what your answer is to the question. Okay, so it's not a waste of word count. It is crucial. Now, going back to that uh, thing I was saying, if a client were to come to you for legal advice, what would typically happen is that the client will tell you what his problem is and he'll give you certain facts. And in all likelihood, the client will come to you giving you certain facts that he thinks are re relevant and important. And when you think about it, it's very possible that what he thinks are important and or relevant may not really be as important or as relevant from your viewpoint. It's important, therefore, that you dig some of these facts out. You need to probe what the problem, you know, what the other factual scenarios are. Which means, therefore, that applying that to the problem-based questions that we have for the final written online assessment, you must be prepared to make certain assumptions. Okay, so let's assume that the problem, a problem is given. It may not tell you whether or not uh, an application to the to the administ administrative appeals tribunal is possible. It may not tell you that. Or it may not tell you if there is a ground for review under the ADJR Act. You make certain assumptions. And we're gonna go to that in a short while. You have to make certain assumptions. And let's assume that you know a person was fired. You make an assumption. If, if it doesn't say if there was a hearing, you'd probably say if there was a hearing, then this is what will happen. If there was no hearing, then this is what will happen. So in other words, if the problem does not contain facts, certain facts which you think are important in coming up with a proper answer, then you make certain assumptions. It might, you might say that it depends on what the fact, facts are of the case. If this is the fact, then this is how we will proceed. If this is the fact, this is how we will proceed. It is your job to make the assumptions. So would that be clear? Clear enough. Okay. Any questions so far before we go to the substantive aspect now of administrative law?
Uh, from that, yep, you're trying to cover several options. So come up with a comprehensive answer. After all, you have 24 hours to do it, to get it done, or at least, you know, excluding sleeping time and other things you need to do. Eight hours is more than enough time to be able to come up with a, a good answer to the assessment task. So we could proceed with the uh, substantive aspect. Okay. Now, these are the uh, substantive aspects that will come out in the, uh, in the final assessment. Oh, obviously, it's always about whether it's judicial review or merit review that is appropriate. Okay, now uh, let's begin by looking at the minimum distinctions. If you speak of judicial review, the focus of judicial review is always the legality or lawfulness of a decision. It's never a question of looking at the facts. Whether it, it, uh, It's never about trying to determine whether, uh, based on the facts, the correct decision was made. It's always a question of, was the uh, decision lawfully made? So it's always a question of legality. And because it's a question of legality, some of the questions you always ask is, you know, were the rules of natural justice uh, followed? And we're going to discuss that further in a short while. Were the relevant considerations that were required by an enactment, for example, considered? Were, uh, were there irrelevant considerations that were not meant to be considered that were considered? So these are some of the questions you need to ask. In other words, by looking at Section 5 of the ADJR Act, you'll be asking, like, uh, did the, the decision maker have the power to make the decision in the first place? You might also be asking whether there was, in fact, evidence. Uh, you might also be asking whether or not, uh, you know, there, there was uh, witness very unreasonableness on the part of the decision maker uh, in the sense that Looking at the, the way that the decision was made, it's unlikely for a, decision, a, a sensible person who is arriving at that decision to come up with a contrary, uh, to, to come up with a contrary opinion. In other words, if, 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 if you bring along these facts to a decision maker and they all agree that this is the correct and uh, this is the, the only proper decision to have been made, and yet, the decision maker ends up making a decision quite contrary to what uh, any sensible decision maker would would have arrived at, then you would have met the standards of witness very unreasonableness. So as far as judicial review, therefore, is concerned, we focus on lawfulness or the legality of the decision. And so therefore, we can look at uh, the grounds of judicial review under the ADGR Act, and it gives you a sense in Section 5 of what would constitute uh, questions about legality or lawfulness of the decision. Okay, so that's crucial. Now, on the other hand, if you talk about the merits review, you look at merits review again in the context of a decision having to be uh, questioned on the basis of the facts or on the basis of the exercise of a discretion. So, if you feel, so in other words, as far as merit review is concerned, it's never about a question of whether or not the, the, the decision was lawful or whether or not it was legal. Your question always is, um, you would like to have a merit review because you think that when the decision maker made the decision, he may have made a wrong decision on the basis of the facts as they existed or that he exercised his discretion in a different way. So as far as merit review is concerned, it's always about a decision being the correct one based on the facts or the preferable one on the basis of the use of a discretion, which tells you that if a decision was made on the basis of a discretion, so in other words, it could be like, you know, as the decision maker deems fit or according to what is sat satisfactory, according to the decision maker, those are Th those are indicators that you're dealing with a discretion here. Because it's a discretion, there's an, a, an ample room for flexibility as to how the decision will be made. And because of that discretion, because of the wide availability of how a decision will be made, it tells you that it brings you out 
of the of the idea of judicial review. Because remember, when we talk about judicial review, and in particular, if we talk about when it's very unreasonableness, the idea is that any sensible decision maker will only arrive at this particular decision. If there is an, a, an opportunity for two sensible decision makers to arrive at different conclusions, it can only mean that it cannot be, it will not meet the standards of witness theory and reasonableness for the purpose of questioning the legality or lawfulness of a decision, which would then be your ground for applying for judicial review. So remember that when there is hope, for a disagreement among decision makers as to what the correct or preferable decision should be, then your only avenue would be merit review. Because if you apply to the courts on that basis, it will be thrown out because remember, judicial review is a very limited legal remedy. It is very limited in the sense that it is focused only on questions of the legality or lawfulness of the decision. It cannot look into the facts. It is not allowed to. Okay. Now, the only time that you might even say that it can look into the facts is when really there is no evidence, and that is under the ADJR Act. If there is no evidence, that would that would usually amount to an error of jurisdiction. But that you know, it's that is a difficult scenario to be able to imagine that there is no evidence. Okay. Manjo. Yes. Ali. It's Ali speaking. Go ahead. Manjo, can. Can you say your explanation is based on a strict sense of judi judicial review with regard to the principle of witness reasonableness? Like a strict sense. I know what you mean. Legality has to do with judicial review. Mm -hmm. But your explanation seems to be uh, in a strict sense. Because, I mean, uh, you have taken, in, in fact, a logical and other consideration. I know what you're trying to say. Yeah. Judicial review in a strict sense legality. Yeah. But can you look at it in a different uh, point, like what um, in the case of Bond, as well as in the uh, his honourable Blake's. Yeah. Blake, when he mentioned that no evidence, it should be with regard to no consideration. So the, the, your explanation is based on a logical, like strict logical sense. Uh, what what judicial I'm doing. Yeah, what I'm doing is to state what the basic principles are of administrative law. So as a basic principle of administrative law, the rule is judicial review is of limited scope. Judicial power, in the exercise of judicial power for the purpose of judicial review, it is limited solely to questions of the legality or lawfulness of a decision. It's as simple as that. That is the basic principle. It seems to be strict, but that is in fact the case. So you have to be aware of that. Now, if, your if, if, if you have a case problem, and what you wish to do is for the decision of the decision maker to be reviewed on the basis of a wrong appreciation of the facts, or a question of you know, putting the incorrect probative value to certain evidence, or you think that he exercises his discretion in, a, in an improper manner, then in that case, you're not speaking of the legality or the lawfulness of the decision. You're speaking of whether or not the decision was the correct or preferable one. And in that case, you go to merits review. Judicial review would be foreclosed because judicial review is very limited only to those instances when the question involves legality or lawfulness of the decision and no other was that clear so i'm, I'm speaking here of a basic postulate of administrative law that, that is a crucial distinction that you need to be very aware of if it's about yeah, yeah. Factual questions if it involves a factual question it involves the exercise of discretion it involves a question of the exercise of uh the, the use of policy Automatically, it has to be merits review. It cannot, it cannot become the basis of a judicial review because judicial review is limited solely to the question of legality or lawfulness. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. I'm just trying to say, I mean, uh, internal review is very obvious. Uh, the merit review is very obvious. It come down to judicial. Judicial, it's a little bit uh, not a clear cut. If you're gonna come to a strict sense, 
I agree with you. I do. I do agree with you. But when you come to when you look at the the cases of Bond's case and his honor um, Blake's on a on a logical and reasonable, it starts to it starts to lean to a different conclusion on evidence. That's what I'm trying to say. But I do agree with you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we we could probably move on. So we we have the basic post with the basic premise of how they're different. Now, more importantly, it's a, always a question. So therefore, you always have a you always ask. You know, what what are the grounds for the review? Okay, and that's when if it's if it's judicial review, for example, you want to know if you have the proper grounds because there was an error of law. It's contrary to law. There was witness fair and reasonableness, or there was no evidence, or you might say that um, certain relevant considerations that should have been considered were not considered, or irrelevant considerations that should not have been considered were considered. So we know that there are certain available grounds because these grounds constitute what uh, questions of legality or lawfulness will mean. And again, as far as various review, therefore, uh, you always look at the question of the uh, factual correctness of the decision or the propriety of the decision on the basis of the exercise of discretion or the use of uh, policies in the decision by the decision maker. Now, the, more, the other important consideration we need to know is, is judicial review available or is merits review available? The availability, not on the grounds, but on the basis of the jurisdictional aspect this time. So when I speak of, juri of the juris jurisdictional aspect, let's begin first with merits review. As far as uh, merits review is concerned, so let, let, let's talk about two aspects. So as far as merits review is concerned, there are two aspects to it. One, according to Allah, uh, Ali, and he's correct, there is the, the element of an internal review. So you should always suggest that, if possible, have it reviewed internally. In other words, uh, if there is a decision maker who made the decision, possibly, have it reviewed by somebody who is a superior of that decision maker, which means you might even make a, a, an appeal to the minister. So that's the internal review. But the other aspect is when are you able to file an application with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal? So that's the question. The, the rule is for you to be able to apply to the AAT, the, the administrative decision, with, on which, if, so if, if there is an administrative decision that was made and it is based on a law, that law must have provided that an application for review can be made to the AAT. Okay? So for there to be a possibility for the AAT to exercise jurisdiction over an application for review, it is crucial that the enactment on which uh, an administrative decision was made must have provided for the availability of a review by the AAT. In other words, if the administrative decision, which was based on an enactment, does not provide, that enactment does not provide for recourse to the AAT, then merits review is not available. Are we clear? No, no, it's clear. I just want to ask you another question. Go ahead. I'm actually a merit a merit review. It's a, it's a, actually it's a best option, really. If you come down to it, I mean, what I was looking at, let's say, on the merit review's decision, a a party or plaintiff is not happy with the actual decision. Does it mean he can appeal the matter to a judicial review? Hold on, hold on. Um, go go back to that, Ali. So, what were the facts again? I said if a plaintiff or like a person yeah. being reviewed under the, under the merit review, a tribunal. Okay, so you're saying that there was an application that was made to the AAT. That's correct, yes. Okay, and then? And the decision is just being rubber stamped. Okay. And a person is not actually happy with the decision. Yes. On your, on your explanation, can it be? or would judicial review under section 39b and section 75 on a matter will be available so in other words is, is it possible for judicial review to be made obviously it is yes on the basis of a question of law so what do we need to remember Can I just yeah 
Sorry, can, can I just ask Ali if, Ali, are you asking that if you're not satisfied with the merit review that you then have the judicial review available? Is uh, that what you're asking? Sorry, can, can you just give me three minutes? My daughter is just crying. You're probably hearing her now. I'm just going to calm her down, then I'll be back. Just give me three minutes, okay? So I'll, I'll quickly do this. No problem. Actually, Janet, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ali. Okay, we can proceed now. I'm just gonna um, turn off my video. I've got my daughter with me, so if you don't mind. But we can proceed. Uh, Janet, can you repeat what you said, please? Uh, Janet? Hello, are you able to hear me? Well, we can hear you, Manjo. Ah, okay, okay. So, because I heard th there was a discussion between you and Janet. Was that, I was wondering if Janet could repeat what she said. I, I did reply, but I didn't have no answer. Okay. Did Janet drop? Oh, Janet is still there. Janet, are you still there? Um, Janet, your mic is muted. Okay. Um, okay, we'll probably just proceed. Was there anything else? Was there something else you wanted to say, Ali, before we continue? Uh, yeah, yeah, you gave, you gave a scenario. Yeah, yeah, what I was going to try to say, like uh, the question actually, yeah, and actually the question being, being uh, actually being proposed by uh, Janet, Yeah. she's actually is right. Uh, on your explanation, that means a judicial review wouldn't be available unless it's legality involved. Yes. That means... That means, yes, we agree on that. That means Widens, the principle of a Widensbury is not going to apply. Let's say a person not happy with the ATT review. Can a person apply or appeal under Section 39B and Section 75 of the Constitution to a higher on the matter, let's say to a federal matter? Yes, yes. If it's on the basis of a question of law, yes. In other words, decisions of the AAT are subject to review by the federal court on the basis of questions of law, solely on the basis of questions of law. Okay. So, I th I, so thanks, Ali. So I think that was clarified. Now, where were we? Okay, so again, going back to the issue of jurisdiction. So we talked about the potential grounds because the grounds are crucial uh, due to the sudden shower. Okay. <laughs> You're happy about the rain. I was about to hang my clothes, so I was unhappy with the rain coming out in, in Brisbane. Now, so we talk about the grounds because the grounds will tell you whether or not you're looking at a question of law or a question of facts because that tells you whether you should go for judicial review or merits review. Now, having made that determination, you'd, you'd also need to know, the second question you need to know is, would the AAT actually have jurisdiction uh, for an application to review the decision of the decision maker? And the rule is that as far as the, a merits review by the AAT is concerned, the enactment on which the, ad, the administrative decision was, was based on must also provide that recourse can be had to the AAT. So the enactment that was the base that on which the administrative decision was made must also provide that there is a possibility to apply for review with the AAT. In the absence of, uh, of, of that law or an enactment providing for recourse to the AAT, then merit review is unavailable, even if you would have wanted to question the the correctness of the decision on the basis of the facts or the, or, or the propriety of the decision on the basis of the exercise of discretion. So let me, let me repeat. 
the fact alone that you think that uh, a, a judicial review is foreclosed because it does not lend itself to a question of law does not mean that merit review is necessarily available. For there to be the possibility of merit review by the EAT, the enactment on which the administrative decision was, was based on must also provide that a person who is unhappy with a decision made on the basis of an enactment uh, must provide for an application for a review with the EAT to be available. So are we clear about that? Only then can we speak of a merit review. Now, as far as judicial review is concerned, the, what we need to know is that there are many kinds of uh, jurisdictional basis for judicial review. One of them is statutory, and that's the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. And we'll, we'll discuss this uh, briefly. There's also the constitutional uh, basis for a judicial review, and that's based on Section 75 of the Constitution, where uh, in all matters where there is a need for a writ of prohibition, injunction, or mandamus to be issued against an officer of the Commonwealth, then there is uh, recourse to the High Court. So that is a constitutional uh, ju jurisdictional basis for judicial review under the Constitution. As Ali also pointed out, there is another statutory basis for a jurisdiction of judicial review, and that is under the, under the Judiciary Act of 1903, in particular Section 39, where it provides that the Federal Court of Australia or the Federal Circuit Court, which used to be the Federal Magistrate's Court, may have the power to review uh, decisions made by Commonwealth officers. So, so far we've covered three. Uh, jurisdictional sources of law on which you can found an application for judicial review. One is the Constitution, particularly Section 75. Second one, obviously, the statutory basis would be the uh, judicial, the Judiciary Act of 1903, particularly Section 39. The other one, and the more common one, is the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of uh, 1977, Commonwealth. Now, there is actually a fourth basis for a judicial review. And that is what is known as a common law judicial review. So if everything else fails and you, you don't think that uh, you can apply uh, on the basis of uh, either, either the Judiciary Act of 1903 or you can't go to the High Court. Now remember, Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903 is an almost exact restatement of what is in Section 75 of the Constitution, except that this time, it refers to the Federal Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court. Okay, and in those instances, again, we're speaking of in all matters where a writ of prohibition, injunction, or mandamus is sought to be issued against an officer of the Commonwealth. Okay, now, and we have the ADGR Act as well. There is a common law source of judicial review. And this is in instances when, you know, if everything else fails, if you feel that there has been an, ex uh, uh, an excessive or an oppressive exercise uh, of the power of the executive, you can, you can apply for judicial review. And in this case, we, now we are now headed to the issue of remedies. What we need to remember, again, as far as judicial remedies are concerned, is that judicial review is very limited as far as the legal remedies are concerned because it either affirms the decision or it sets it aside. Well, obviously there's also the possibility that the under the ADGR Act, the court may just uh, order a, a decision maker to refrain from doing something or to do something. But again, that is a very, again, of, of very limited scope. So, if you go back to the case of Daniels versus Green, for example, and let's assume that you applied for benefits with Centrelink and, and your application was denied, and you think that there was a misinterpretation of the law by the decision maker, and so therefore you say, I need to apply for judicial review. So, so far, we will assume that the Centrelink law will provide that um, 
there is a recourse to, I mean, it's quite clear that if it's based on, if the administrative decision is based on an enactment, without that enactment having to say that judicial review is available, it still is available. So because as far as judicial review is concerned, for as long as a, an administrative decision is made on the basis of an enactment, judicial review under the ADGR Act is therefore available. Okay, now, but the point is, even assuming that there is an administrative decision that was made, and that administrative decision was made on the basis of an enactment. And remember, enactment has many meanings under the ADGR Act. It includes also rules and regulations made by uh, an executive officer on the basis of a primary legislation that is also considered an enactment. Okay, so it has a wider meaning. Rather than just a statute passed by the Commonwealth Parliament, it can also refer to subordinate legislation or rules and regulations uh, passed by an executive officer on the basis of a primary legis legislation. Now, so let me repeat. Assuming that you know that there is an administrative decision that was based on an enactment, and therefore you know that judicial review is available, the problem still is, how about the remedy? Is it worth going to judicial review if judicial review is limited either to affirming a decision or setting it aside? So in the scenario that I gave, if, if, the, if your goal is to be paid certain benefits, and you think that the amount to be paid, let's say, is about you know five two hundred dollars a week, and uh, Centerlink refused to to give you the two hundred dollars, and you think that it was based on a misinterpretation of the law or the misapplication of the law, that's why you you were meant to be given uh, you know fewer lesser benefits. The problem then is it is not within the power of the courts in the case of a judicial review to order the decision maker. To, to act in a particular way. It cannot order the decision maker to pay that amount of $200 to you, even if you were correct in saying that there was a misapplication of the law. Even if you say that what it involved is a question of law. Are we clear about that? So that is a problem of the issue of remedies. What Was that clear? Now, if you compare... Manjo. Yes. Um, I just want to ask, because on my notes, I've actually put the remedy sort must be made out. Yes. So you've got the court must have jurisdiction, then you go down to number five, the remedy sort must be made out. Yes. That determines if the court will have jurisdiction. Yes. But what I've actually got under that is that limited to decision of original decision maker, set aside or damages. Have I incorrectly put that down there? Yeah, I think damages, you put it there incorrectly. It should not be. Okay, no, I've got no, that from my notes. It there. It shouldn't have been there. No. Okay, no, that's fine because you've got limited to decision of original decision maker set aside or, or decision maker to be directed to do a specific act. And then on the other side of the scales, you've got or procedural matters and substanti substantive matters. Now, the, substan the procedural matters fall in alignment with common law, mm -hmm. that remedies, the, you've got that. Yes. And then the substantive, that's the criteria for lawful or unlawfulness of the decision, and that is the procedural fairness, nat natural justice, etc. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of, I know I've popped all of that under remedies so that I can see whether the court actually, or where jurisdiction lies, if that's a better. Yep. Um, so, for judicial. The, the reason why, in an application for judicial review, you need to be able to set out the remedy is because it flags to the court whether or not you're, you're making a proper application. For example, if the remedy that you're asking is to order the decision maker to do this, let's say pay you a certain amount of money pay damages or um, provide you with these kinds of benefits, then outright the court will, you know, the court is able to tell that the judicial review is the proper remedy because it is beyond the power of the court to do that. So as far as judicial review is concerned, when it is available, there, there are two main ways by which a, 
a judge can make a decision. He either affirms the decision or he or um, he rejects the decision, in which, case, in which case he sets it aside. Or he can actually remit it back to the decision maker. Now, there is a limited scope in the ADJR Act where the, uh, the Federal Circuit Court or the Federal Court of Australia may actually order the decision maker to refrain from doing something or to do something. But when we, when we talk about that, we, we are not speaking in the context of a specific, of a specific prayer, for example, that, you know, of certain benefits to be paid. Because following the decision in Greens versus Daniels, uh, the court clarified that even if it realized that judicial review was the appropriate remedy, it was not within its power to grant the prayer because of the limitations of uh, the remedies available as far as judicial review is concerned. So was that clear? Would that be clear enough? Now, okay, now, to continue, you have remedies under the ADJR Act, and they are of limited scope, okay? But there are also what are known as common law remedies. Now, we have constitutional law remedies, and we have remedies, statutory remedies, on the, uh, on the basis of Section 39B of the Judiciary Act of 1903. And this refer, refer to writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction. Okay, so those are limited writs that are available. Prohibition means to, to, ref, to stop or restrain uh, an, a Commonwealth officer from doing something. So it could be to stop a, uh, an exact Commonwealth officer from deporting somebody. That's prohibition. Injunction to order uh, a, uh, an, an officer of the Commonwealth to do a specific act because that is the right of a person. So the, the only time when you can speak of an injunction, or rather, uh, especially if it's a mandatory injunction, if it is on the basis of a clear right. Okay, now, the other thing we need to remember, therefore, is that there is a broader scope for uh, legal remedies, and this is in relation to common law remedies. And one of those, for example, um, would be in relation to... Uh, Issues of certiorari, where you may you may you know question uh, the the lawfulness of a decision, but again, for the purpose of solely for the purpose of the uh, final written online assessment, I would rather that you just, you just focus as far as the remedies are on whether you're speaking of a constitutional uh, law remedy on the basis of Section seventy five, or on the basis of the Judiciary Act of nineteen o three, particularly. Um, Section 39B of the Judicial Act of 1903, or thirdly, uh, the remedies that are available on the basis of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. Okay, so are we clear as far as these things are concerned? Then we, then we can move to natural justice, because these are the only common themes that will appear in the, fi in the final written online assessment. So are we happy to proceed? Hi, Manjo, just one question. Yes, please. Ali. Actually, just on a mandatory injunction, that yeah. will fall under an equitable remedy, won't it? It is. It will fall under the equitable remedy. So the, the reason why you, you sometimes go to the common law remedies, and we discussed it the last time, is that sometimes if you follow, if you follow the statute, the, stat, the, the rules, the, 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 it might be possible that if you, if you follow the law, then recourse to judicial review is not available. It's not possible because there are strict requirements. The requirements might be you must have uh, applied for judicial review within a period of 30 days, or there must have been a requirement that um, a specific decision must have been done in this way. So there are certain jurisdictional elements that must be met before uh, judicial review is available on the basis of the Constitution or on the basis of statute. If you speak of if you speak of equitable remedies, on the other hand, this is an attempt to say that if we follow the flex, if we follow the rigid rules of the law, then we will not be able to render justice. 
So therefore, you apply for a judicial review for equitable remedies uh, in a judicial review. And in that case, it can be more encompassing in the sense that a, a mandatory injunction, for example, may order a specific act to be done. Okay, but the problem is the rule is also quite clear that equitable remedies would usually only be available if you don't have an available re, uh, remedy under the law, meaning under statutory law. Actually, Manjo, I mean, yes. you're, you're right, but I, what, what I was, what was referring to, you, you're quite right, uh, under this mandatory injunction, would it be first to actually try to get a normal a common, uh, like commonwealth remedy instead of equitable remedy? Because you have to actually seek uh, commonwealth remedies as, as mandamus and senatory and prohibition before actually you seek equitable remedies. Is that correct? Uh, no, that, that, that's not really correct because what we have to remember is that courts, our courts, chapter three courts, are both courts of law and courts of equity. Okay? So in um, Imperial England, you know, uh, in the 1800s, there was a distinction between the, the common law courts, and that would usually correspond to the chapter three courts, and what were known as courts of the exchequer or the courts of the king. So when the, you know, when the, the rigid rules of the common law system would, would say that certain remedies were not available to a litigant, then they would appeal to the king, appeal to notions of equity and fairness and justice. However, however uh, as far as, I'm just trying to put my video on now because my daughter is all over here. Hold on, I'm just trying to look for that. Uh, okay, who's start my video. Okay. Now, however, as far as uh, laws, uh, I mean, courts of Australia are concerned, they are both courts of law and courts of equity. So in other words, if you apply for judicial review, if you feel that the stringent rules of positive law, when you speak of positive law, therefore, you know, statutes or uh, judicial precedents, if the rigid application of, these, of the positive law would lead to an injustice because, let's say, the rule was, you know, you, you are given 30 days uh, to, to file your application, and if you miss that, then your, your right prescribes. In that case, you appeal to justice, sense of fairness or justice. And that's when, you know, you apply to, uh, you, you, go, you have a recourse to equitable remedies because uh, the common law remedies are no longer available or the statutory remedies are no longer available. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. That actually, the Commonwealth remedies are not available because a mandatory injunctions will fall under equitable remedy. That means a court of chancellery. That means a court of chancellery will come in after the Commonwealth remedies not available. Is wait, wait, that wait, correct? Wait. We're talking of Australia here. There is no such thing as a chancery a, a chancery court. No, no, I'm just saying to you as a history, that's all. Ah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. History. yeah, so uh, historically that's true, but as I said, if you speak of any chapter of the court, they are both courts of law and courts of equity. Okay, so we're happy to proceed. Now, Let's proceed. Let's talk about, this is crucial, the notion of natural justice or uh, procedural fairness, and this will appear in the uh, assessment. Let's begin. What exactly does the notion of natural justice or procedural fairness mean? There are actually two aspects to, to it. The first is uh, the right to be heard, and the other one is uh, the right to an impartial uh, judge, impartial or objective judge. In other words, there should be no bias on the part of the decision maker. So therefore, if the decision maker has an animosity towards you, then there would be a breach of uh, natural justice if that decision maker makes a decision in the first place. That would be a breach of natural justice. Uh, the right to procedural fairness, uh, the other aspect, as I said, is the right to be heard. And what this means is that if you have a right or you have an interest or a legitimate expectation 
that will be interfered upon by a decision, then you should be given an opportunity to be heard, to, to say your piece, to provide your evidence. That is a basic rule. Okay, now, what is important to remember is that the idea, the principle of natural justice or procedural fairness is a, yes, they are one and the same. Um, Justice Dean was saying that, you know, you might say that terminology-wise they're different, but they're actually one and the same. Uh, that's in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of, in the, uh, in the case uh, involving bond. Now, what we need to remember is that the principle of natural justice or procedural fairness is a common law principle. In other words, it is a principle based on decisions of judges. Now, because it is a common law principle, it can be displaced by statute. So, what it means is, assuming that a decision uh, will impair the right or the interest or the legitimate expectation of a person, then there is a common law presumption that natural justice should be observed. Okay, so that, that is the basic rule there. For if a decision of a decision maker will impair or infringe upon the right, interest, or legitimate expectation of a principle, the common law rule is natural justice or procedural fairness must be observed. Now, because that is a common law principle, it can be displaced by statute. So in other words, if a law provides, and that is the basis of the decision of the decision maker, if the law provides that there is no right to a hearing, or it provides for a certain procedure to be followed, and it says that, you know, um, a decision can be made by the decision maker without giving a person an opportunity to be heard, then in that case, that positive law, that statute, displaces the common law principle concerning natural justice. So there, in other words, if you have a situation where the right of a person might have been impaired by a decision of a decision maker, and the facts seem to be incomplete, then you, you, make, you state the premise that under common law principles, the rules of natural justice or procedural fairness should be observed if the rights, interests, or legitimate expectations of a person are impaired by a decision of a decision maker. And therefore, in that case, the rules of natural justice require that there should be an opportunity to be heard, and secondly, that there should be that the decision maker must be free of bias. However, because the facts are not clear, it is possible that the law may actually provide, the law on which a decision was based, may actually provide that uh, natural justice does not have to be observed. So are we clear? So in general, natural as a common law principle, natural justice should be observed. But if the law expressly provides, or in, in, in the language of the law uh, significantly shows that natural justice should not be observed, then that statute or that positive law displaces the common law principle. Is that clear? Now, let's, let's go on. However, even if we speak of the rules of natural justice or procedural fairness, as I said, it has to refer to a right, an interest, or a legitimate expectation. In other words, if there is no right, then there is no, there is no room for natural justice to come in. For example, let's assume that you apply for a Centrelink benefit, and you're, you think that you ought to be given a $500 a week. Therefore, you apply with Centrelink. Now, Centrelink turns you down. The question is, was there a legal requirement that Centrelink should have given you, you know, before it making a decision, it should have kept on coming back to you and asking for more evidence before it was able to make a decision? What we, what we need to remember at that point is that you do not have a right. Okay? And you cannot speak of a legitimate expectation. That's why you're still applying. Now, however, if you had, if you had already been given a Centrelink uh, endowment, for example, or a benefit, then that is a matter of right. Now, if Centrelink all of a sudden says, oops, we're going to change your benefit to this amount, then the rules of natural justice will come in because now your right is being impaired. 
So it's very crucial, therefore, that looking at the facts, the question is, are you dealing with the right interest or legitimate expectation? Because if you are not, then the principle of natural justice will not apply. Was that clear enough? Yes, clear enough? Good. Now, Can I just um, go, ahead, go over that? Yes. So, for example, we sent a link. There isn't a right to expect to, well, there isn't a right to a benefit itself. A particular but benefit. You, a particular benefit. A particular benefit. But yes. if you have already got, are in receipt of a particular benefit, yes. then by default you automatically have a right. Yes. Okay. So because you've already been given to it, that's an entitlement that is your right now. It cannot just be, you know, removed or changed by... Um, Center link without giving you without according you natural justice. Go to Kuyamanjo. Now, the other thing we need to know that the other thing we need to ask is so assuming that you know you have a situation where you have a obviously an admin, administrative decision maker and he makes a decision which is contrary to your right interest or legitimate expectation. The question is. Is there a legal requirement that he must provide reasons for his decision? Or would it be sufficient that he decides, um, okay, uh, we, we, we've been, we cannot give you this, or he says, you know, you're, you're, you're terminated from this position. So the question is, is there a requirement that he should provide reasons for the decision? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Okay? Now, the only instance when there is a requirement for a decision to be made is when the decision maker is required to act judicially. And in that case, the only time when they are expected to act judicially is when they're in the, in, in the form of administrative tribunals. So the AAT, for example, although it is not a chapter three court, it is expected. Go, go to Manny, he'll help you. So as far as the AAT is concerned, uh, because Although it is not a chapter three court, it is expected to uh, act judicially. So in which case, it is required to follow the rules of natural justice or procedural fairness. However, as far as other decision makers are concerned, unless the law provides that that decision maker must uh, give the reasons for the decision, there is no right to a reason for the decision. Can you just give me a minute? Because otherwise my, my daughter won't stop. Just give me a minute. So in that case, everybody, does that mean that if you don't receive a reasons for a decision, you can apply for a merit review to get those reasons? Hello, Janet. It depends. It depends. I mean, the, uh, under the ITT, the executive it doesn't have any reason to actually give you why they actually arrived to the reason. But if it was required under statutes, they have to actually give a, a required reason. So would you then just ask nicely and say, I'd like, a, a, um, I'd like the reasons to be provided to me? Or do you have no recourse to that at all? You can try, Janet. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm back. So uh, I heard that uh, that, that discussion and uh, the question of Janet. Um, so the advantage is, assuming that merit review to the AAT um, is available, uh, rather, assuming that your purpose is to seek judicial review and no decision was given by the uh, decision maker. The rule, there is a rule in the ADJR Act that if your application falls under Section 5, meaning the, 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 it falls under one of those grounds for which judicial review is available under the ADJR Act, then the decision maker uh, will be compelled to provide a reason for his decision. Manjo, yes. are we talking about the ATT or a QCAT? No, I'm talking about the judicial review. I'm talking about the judicial review. So unless, 
uh, unless it required under statutes. Uh, which which part of this uh, is this Ali? No, Janet asked a different question. It has to do with the ITT, not judicial review. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of the judicial review. So again, um, assuming that a decision was made by a decision maker, remember that the AAT will stand in the shoes of the original decision maker. So it, it, will, it, is, it will most likely happen that um, it's either that the AAT will ask the decision maker to provide uh, the reasons for the decision or on its own, it can make a, a, an original determination as if it were standing in the shoes of the original decision maker. But if the question is, if the question is, is there a legal obligation on the part of the original decision maker to provide a reason for the decision, the answer is no, unless, unless uh, the, the statute requires it. Okay, so I understand, I think. So if there is an enactment available for a merits review at the AAT, they are expected to act judici judicially, yes. in which case a reason must be provided, but it needs by to get AAT. to that. Oh, hold on. By the AAT. The one who's yeah, by the AAT. Not the AAT, not the original decision maker. No, and, yep, I've got it. Thank you. Yeah. So as far as the AAT is concerned, they will always provide reasons for their decisions. But if the question was, in relation to the original decision maker, which was the, the basis of the, you know, the original problem that your client may have, it's possible that the decision maker did not provide a reason. Okay, so in that case, the question is, um, do you have, can, can you compel the decision maker to provide reasons for the decision under the ADGR Act? The answer is yes. As far as the AAT, it is also within the power of the AAT to order the decision maker to provide reasons. But in a sense, that becomes unnecessary because remember, the AAT stands in the shoes of the original decision maker. So therefore, uh, the original decision maker, I mean, therefore, the AAT actually tries to evaluate the evidence from the very beginning. And it can decide to uh, vary the decision. Set it aside, so it has wider powers because it is permitted to vary the decision of the original decision maker. So those are just the crucial points. Would there be any questions that you might have? Yep, there is one. I'm just clarifying. When you talked about judicial review in the ADJR Act Section 5, yes. you were referring to that in context that the AAT must act judicially. Is that correct? No, no, those are two different things. Okay, sorry. I've, so, yep, already those are two different things. So if it's Section 5 of the ADJR Act, you're necessarily speaking of judicial review. Now, the AAT... Yeah, no, that's all right. I made a wrong merit, connection. That's, that's merit review. If it's the AAT, it's merit review, not judicial review. But, hello, Manjo. Hold on, hold on. But, Janet, as far as the AAT is concerned, even if yep. it's not a Chapter 3 court, hello? it is required to act judicially. Okay. Yeah, I was looking at it though because because uh, of the ADJR Act, then there was a, a parallel, if you like, between that and the requirement for the AAT to act judicially under not not directly under Section Five of the ADJR Act because they don't, but the similarity was well in the case of the judicial review, the ADJR Act Section Five requires the decision maker to provide reasons. Similarly, the AAT must provide reasons for their decision because they are expected to act judicially. Correct. But that was where I was coming from. Yes. And we need to remember that the original decision maker is not required to act judicially. No, I've got that down. So that's crucial. Okay. Emmanuel. Hey, yes, Ali. It's Ali. Can you please just explain a little bit sec uh, Section 5 and the AJD Act with connection to subsection uh, 3B, please, just a little bit? Section 3B? What's the question there? Yeah, it's actually in connection with Bond's case and his Honorable Blake's. 
Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit, just. Uh, just a little bit of explanation on section 5, subsection B3. Section 5, subsection 3B. Yes. So let's assume that a decision uh, was made by a decision maker. And that decision makes an assumption that this certain fact existed. That fact could have been that um, that person uh, hit somebody or that person uh, stole money. And in fact, those facts did not exist. Then that is a situation where Section 5.3b comes into play. When the person who made the decision based on the, uh, when the person who made the decision based the decision on the existence of a particular fact and that fact did not exist. Are you happy with that, Ali? Yeah, yeah, just want to see your point of view, that's all. Okay, any other questions that you might have? So none? So shall we call it a night? And I'll wish you well, this is our last meeting. I wish you well. Um, yeah, I wish you well in your course. I'm teaching contracts uh, in term three. I don't know if you will be doing this again. I'm teaching. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Good one, Matt. It'll be great if you become a a solicitor. You'll end up becoming the the public prosecutor. That'll be great. Okay. So. Um, Thank you everyone for always being there uh, in most of our tutorial sessions and I wish you the best in the final written online assessment. Okay? Thank you. We don't, uh, we have a shoot in, on Monday for constitutional law, but no longer for, this is our last session for administrative law. Okay, thank you everyone for being nice. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, Major. Thank you, Matt.